What does a well-known and well-loved parable from the Old Testament and Africa's highest peak, Mount Kilimanjaro, have in common? What is the thread that links this mysterious mountain to a Greek scholar of the second century, European explorers of the 19th century, and an astonishing scientific discovery of modern times? Keep watching to discover the answers to these questions and to learn about the science behind the secrets that lay buried deep within the snows of one of the world's most popular climbing destinations, Mount Kilimanjaro. In the book of Genesis, 37 through 50, Joseph was the favored son of Jacob, a Canaanite, he of the amazing technicolor dream coat. His siblings, jealous of the favor bestowed upon him and wary of his strange gift of prophecy, sold him into slavery, lying to their father that he was dead. Jacob had given Joseph a beautifully colored coat as a sign of his favor, and his envious siblings smeared goat's blood on this coat as a sign of proof of his death. Joseph found himself enslaved in the household of the captain of the Pharaoh's guard, where the captain's wife attempted to seduce him, leading to Joseph's imprisonment. It was in prison that Joseph began to interpret the dreams of his captors, which caught the attention of the Pharaoh himself. The Pharaoh asked Joseph to interpret two distressing dreams that he had experienced, one about seven fat cows being devoured by seven thin ones, and another dream about stalks of wheat. One had seven robust heads, whereas seven more were thin and scorched by the wind from the east. Joseph interpreted these dreams to mean that Egypt would experience seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of drought. Joseph was able to urge the Pharaoh to store grain for the coming famine, and it was this advice that successfully carried the Egyptians through this drought and famine. These events are believed to have occurred in the early 2nd millennium BCE, but could have taken place much earlier. But what does an often told Sunday school story have to do with the tallest mountain on the African continent? In the year 2000, American scientists made a revelatory discovery inside the snows of Mount Kilimanjaro that may provide invaluable insight into the story of Joseph. Yet, before these scientists made their discovery, another scientist from the 2nd century had an important part to play in this story. How did the monolith of the Dark Continent first enter the collective consciousness of the West in order for such a discovery to be made in the year 2000? In the 2nd century CE, the Greek astronomer and cartographer Ptolemy wrote of a great snow mountain that rose up from the mysterious lands to the south. This knowledge may have come to him from the Phoenicians, who had likely sailed around the Dark Continent of Africa by Ptolemy's time. This remains the first known written reference to Africa's tallest peak. Then, we have very few historical records relating to Mount Kilimanjaro for almost 1600 years. Fast forward to 1846, when two German missionaries, Dr. Ludwig Kroff and Johann Rebmann, established a mission near the town of Mombasa in what is now modern-day Kenya. In 1849, both men confirmed sightings of the Great Mountain, leading to the Royal Geographical Society expressing disbelief that snow could exist so close to the equator. In 1861, a young geoscientist called Richard Thornton attempted the first ascent. He and his party only got as high as 7,875 feet, but it was enough for him to be able to visually confirm that there was snow on the top of the mountain, to estimate Kilimanjaro's height and to assume its volcanic nature. Kilimanjaro's summit would not be conquered by man for another 28 years. At its highest point, the mountain stands at an impressive 19,340 feet. Today, it is estimated that an astonishing 30,000 intrepid visitors climb all the way to the top, Uhuru Peak, every year. The authorities are understandably reluctant to release firm figures on the number of people who die in the attempt to reach the summit each year, given that much revenue is earned from the climbing industry. Kilimanjaro is a tempting climb for inexperienced mountaineers because there is no rock climbing involved. However, there are still dangers present. The current estimate stands at 10 fatalities per year, and unlike Mount Everest, dead bodies are relatively easy to retrieve from the mountain face via helicopter and stretcher, hence why there are no human bodies frozen in the ice on Kilimanjaro's peak. In a 2015 study, it was found that in the years spanning 1996 to 2003, 25 people died, the majority succumbing to respiratory complications due to the altitude. No porters were included in these figures, despite the fact that porters climbing the mountain outnumber tourists at a ratio of 3 to 1. This is because autopsies are not compulsory for this group of climbers. But it is not only the numerous deaths that take place annually on Mount Kilimanjaro that contribute to the mysterious nature of this natural wonder. Long before scientists discovered the link between Joseph and Mount Kilimanjaro, the local people who reside at the mountain's base had their own stories to tell. During the missionary period, the local people who lived near the foot of Kilimanjaro were loath to try to climb it in case they angered God, believing it to be the seat of the Almighty. 
They took the glistening white snow at Kilimanjaro's peak as a sign of its connection to the heavens, and believed that its melting snow was a sign of God's displeasure at people daring to scale its peak. This local tribe, called the Chaga people, told a myth about a race of pygmies who dwelled in Kilimanjaro's caves. When there is too much rain, the Chaga bow to the mountain, asking God to make the rain cease, and when there is drought, they blame Kilimanjaro's demons. Historians cannot agree upon the origins of the mountain's name. There are several suggestions. One is that it is a variant of a Chaga phrase, which means difficult to climb. Despite being difficult to climb, this has not hampered the efforts of modern-day explorers and researchers seeking to discover the mysteries of Mount Kilimanjaro for themselves. Those intrepid enough to ascend the roof of Africa will pass through five diverse climate zones. At Kilimanjaro's base is cultivated land, used by the locals, which receives the most water runoff from the mountain's glaciers. Next is the emerald green rainforest zone, where animal species abound. The local people have told stories of mountain gorillas dwelling in the rainforest zone of Kilimanjaro, though no scientific evidence exists to prove this. The rainforest gradually becomes heather and moorland, where temperatures are often erratic. Then there is the highland desert zone, where the summit's vast glaciers can be seen clearly. And finally, the peak itself in the summit or arctic zone, where the mythical snows of Kilimanjaro freeze over into glacial ice. The frozen snow leopard carcass found in this zone in Ernest Hemingway's 1936 fictional short story, The Snows of Kilimanjaro, was based on a fact. A Lutheran pastor called Richard Roche made a fascinating discovery in 1926 at approximately 18,500 feet during a trek to the summit of Kilimanjaro, where he found the carcass of a frozen snow leopard. It had been frozen in its pursuit of a mountain goat, which was also found preserved in the ice a few hundred feet away. This was an exciting discovery because snow leopards are usually not to be found this high up on the mountain. And it was in this same Arctic zone where American scientists made an even more fascinating discovery in 2000. Evidence that the story of Joseph may have its foundations in fact. In 2000, the University of Ohio sent a team of scientists to the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro to drill for ice samples. The university then published a report detailing an analysis of six ice cores that were taken. The precious ice core samples taken by these scientists provide a wealth of information about Kilimanjaro's atmosphere via molecules frozen in the ice. This ice records climatic events and conditions through analyzing frozen oxygen bubbles and chemicals trapped within its precious layers. The same study warned that within 20 years, the ice and snow atop Mount Kilimanjaro will disappear due to global warming. Fortunately, these samples will continue to reveal the secrets of the snows of Mount Kilimanjaro because they have been stored in the freezers of the university's Bird Polar Research Center in Columbus, Ohio. Furthermore, these ice cores are evidence of a Holocene, that is the current geological epoch, climate change in eastern Africa over an 11 to 12,000 year period, and demonstrate that there had been two earlier major droughts, one 8.3 thousand years ago and one 5.2 thousand years ago. The time of Joseph's drought coincides with the first dark age in ancient history. Around 2200 BCE, the very stable society of ancient Egypt and other world powers fell into sudden anarchy and heralded the end of the 6th dynasty in circa 2181 BCE. It seems logical that it would take something as catastrophic as a long drought and subsequent famine to send this previously stable civilization into chaos. These ice cores, along with a visible layer of dust in the sample, provide conclusive evidence that Kilimanjaro experienced a catastrophic 300-year-long drought which happened 4,000 years ago. Prior to that, methane levels in the ice cores indicate that Africa's climate was lush and wet, with Lake Chad then covering as large an area as the Caspian Sea does today. This event and its date roughly coincide with the time of the Pharaoh's dream and Joseph's subsequent interpretation that Egypt was headed for a terrible drought. A member of the research team stated they had little idea that their discovery would make the world refer to a specific chapter in the book of Genesis. This revelation raises another question. How is dust on top of a mountain in Tanzania relevant to a drought in Egypt, a country that lies some 2,300 miles to its north? The answer to this conundrum is that Mount Kilimanjaro has long been considered to be one of the main sources of Egypt's Nile, along with Tanzania's Lake Victoria and the Mountains of the Moon, which run along the border between Uganda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The Nile supported all life in ancient Egypt. If there was no snow on top of Mount Kilimanjaro that could melt and trickle into the tributaries of the mighty Nile, then the river would dry up. The life-bringing floods would not occur and no irrigation of crops could take place, bringing forth the famine from Joseph's prophecy. Other scientific studies can also confirm that a huge drought rocked ancient Egypt 4,000 years ago. Pollen and charcoal preserved in the sediment of the Nile can attest to this. 
In 2012, the United States Geological Survey published a study in which scientists hypothesized that in times of drought, pollen levels in the sediment would be low because there would be no crops, and charcoal levels in the sediment would be high, and indicative that fire had swept the area, as often happens during times of drought. This hypothesis turned out to be correct. Not only is the story of Egypt's devastating drought recorded in the Old Testament, it is also referred to in the Islamic Quran and the Jewish Torah. While the scientific findings in the ice cores taken from the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro cannot definitively prove the authenticity of the story of Joseph from the book of Genesis, they do support this well-known biblical story of great drought and famine in Egypt. They demonstrate that there was indeed a lengthy drought in Africa around the same time that Joseph attended the Egyptian pharaoh and are another fascinating example of science being used to understand historical text more deeply. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video, and leave your suggestions in the comments below.